Hi everyone. Um, my name is Christian Novia. I'm president of the Poli Sci Club. Um, just to let you know, this is feminism and politics. Uh, we are hosting this discussion panel. Um, it should run about an hour and a half, two hours, depending on how you know each one of you participates. Uh, uh, we have, as you can see, we have an empty seat right now. Um, the mayor should be joining us shortly. Um, but just a little information: uh, the Political Science Club does have meetings every other Wednesday. We don't have events such as this. Um, they meet in Ruby Jones 001. It's kind of on the bottom, bottom floor. Um, we have a lot of confusion about that. Um, and if you want to, you know, see what we're all about, you know, we're about events like this. We're about just overall discussion at our meetings. Um, we meet at 7:30 in 001. Um, every other Wednesday. Um, if you want to get on the email list, please um, write it down and give it to me either after this um, or to one of my members, such as Jackson Smith or Casey or Anthony. Um, as of that, we're here to discuss just the general overview of feminism in the political world. I want to really more focus on the uh, U.S. in particular, but the have to be constrained to the U.S. Obviously, global movements are very important, especially to our perception and our view of ourselves. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to the panelists to give us a brief introduction of themselves, and then we can get started. Okay. Uh, good evening. I'm so glad to see a nice crowd, and I'm honored that I was invited to participate. I'm uh, Vice President of the Chester County League of Women Voters, and I'm also Membership Chair. So uh, I think that I'll probably bring a different perspective to the discussion tonight. Uh, we don't usually focus on feminism, women, and voting. Uh, for the most part, we focus on trying to encourage and empower everybody in the community to vote and to get educated about uh, the candidates, the issues, and uh, just things that are important to to them. I'm Lisa Rukti, and I'm a faculty member in Women's and Gender Studies and also the Department of Anthropology and Sociology. So I'm a sociologist and a feminist scholar. And um, I'm really excited. I feel like I'm in great company <laughs> tonight. I'm so excited to have been included um, as part of this panel. And hopefully I can bring um, just general information perhaps about feminism. And um, I also want to give a shout out to the Gender Studies Club. I see some people here from the Gender Studies Club. And if you are interested in you know, participating in Gender Studies Club, they meet outside of the Women's Center um, on Thursday nights at 7.30. And also, I want to give a quick shout out to our director of the Women's Center, Adele Shalock, because she is here tonight as well. And I'm very excited to see her too. My name is Lynn Stevenson. I am the um, I'm a professor in the political science department. Uh, mostly, I teach in the international relations track, so I may internationalize a little bit more um, than my colleagues. And um, I mostly do. I'm also the director of Latin American and Latino studies. Um, so my second uh, part of my focus in my political science work is generally in the region. And um, anyone who's gone through the culture clusters for Spanish at, and Westchester often treads their path through my department and through my classes, so um, uh, that's a lot of fun. I um, have done research in Mexico primarily, so um, I've done a lot of work on um, democratization in the region and how people are getting out the vote, those kinds of things, so it's been really interesting to compare with U.S. processes um, with, as Mexico has opened up over the last 20 years. I, I've been actually watching what's going on there, um, lived there for seven years, so that had a lot of influence in terms of my own kind of um, understanding of the region um, and then being able to compare in other countries. Um, my more recent work has been in Chile um, and that is what um, I have friends in Chile and I joked with them, I said, look, they had two women running for president and I do women in politics. So I said, you elect a woman, I'm coming, right? And I was teasing, but they did it. So um, I finally got my ducks in a row and got down to Chile for my sabbatical and um, studied, tried to look at how uh, President Bachelet, and I can tell you some more about her, that might be part of where I'll focus a little bit, um, uh, was able to influence as the, the first female president of Chile, um, gender equity policies and um, policies for women's rights in general. So. 
And as I said, uh, Mayor Kamita will be joining us uh, shortly, uh, as soon as possible, hopefully. Um, but how the panel is going to go is like this. Um, I have a few basic questions and a little bit more, you know, um, complex ones, uh, ranging from you know just voting to feminism as a whole. Um, but I, what I'm really hoping is that you all, the audience, will gladly participate, ask your own questions, feed off of it, you know, give the answers, debate, whatever you want. Uh, just raise your hand. I'll call on you if you get your time. As long as it doesn't get any bit kind of rowdy like it has in the past, uh, we'll be fine. Um, so I just want to open it up with a basic question, and this is maybe primarily to uh, the more feminist-minded uh, panelists. Um, what does it mean to be a feminist to you? And what role can men play in them? Okay. Um, I'm glad you asked that question, Christian. What does it mean to be a feminist to me and then the role of men also? So that's a two-parter. Um, I, Patricia Hill Collins is a black feminist scholar who's also a sociologist, and she um, has a quote that I really like, and she says, I like to use words as weapons, as tools. And I've always felt that feminism, for me, is a toolkit that people can use. Um, when I teach about feminism, I make sure I let my students know that it can be an identity. You, know, you can either be one or not. Um, but it can also be, regardless if you are or not a feminist, you can use feminism in your institutions, um, in your move, social action movements. Um, and you know, when you think about that, when you sort of think historically about feminism, you can pinpoint, like there, here are examples of some feminist movements, like suffrage, the right to vote, you know, which I'm sure Meryl will be talking about in a little bit. You can also think about feminism as uh, how it informs different print media. Some of you may or may not be familiar with Ms. Magazine, you know, one of the first magazines that was really produced without advertising, um, focusing on issues, feminist issues. Um, does it include, there are also different types of feminism. I can talk about that later um, if that's helpful. And then you can also think about feminism through issues like you know, focusing on intimate violence or state-sanctioned violence like war. Um, what's the feminist perspective on work? What's the feminist perspective on sport? What's the feminist perspective on education? And then today, what's the feminist perspective on politics, right? So you can use it in different ways. Um, men have always been a part of feminism. There, and so what we like to talk about in women's and gender studies, at least, is that this is, this is where men have always identified as feminists, as far back as we've documented that. Um, there is absolutely a role for men to be allies in dealing with gender-based oppression. And there's a role for men to talk about different kinds of oppression that they may experience based on other identities, like race, class, sexuality, um, et cetera. So men have been writers in the feminist movement. Men continue to be activists in the feminist movement. We have a man who's the director of our Women's and Gender Studies program right now. You know, so there it's, and in our gender studies club, it's pretty much gender mixed. So I, so my perspective as somebody who's been doing this work, uh, Sunday, it'll be 20 years. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, in various ways, men have always been a part of this story. So, so I think I'll stop there. I consider fem, uh, I'm a feminist, but, and I consider it to be, when I think of uh, the issues, whether it's intellectual or social issues, I think about uh, just the equality, you know, uh, gender equality. And when it comes to the League of Women Voters and voting, I think it's important. We, we, we're not really supposed to uh, focus on gender for the most part, but I know that in reality, women vote for specific things and men vote for specific things. Uh, there are so-called women's issues and so-called male issues. And uh, when, when 
I go out to try to empower voters and talk about the issues, I don't usually focus on just trying to educate women about women's issues. I think that uh, when I look at our community, I think about the, 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 the entire community. And I think about that everyone's equal and everyone should have uh, the same opportunities. So uh, when I think about women who are focused on just education and social issues, um, poverty, things like that, I also want to include the men in the community in educating and empowering them about these issues. Women, for the most part, I think stay away from um, financial, fiscal issues when it comes to voting. I think most women tend to vote for the candidates who uh, they feel they relate to uh, more with, with social issues. And uh, I've been just interested in looking at statistics lately about how single women for the most part, are the ones that come out to vote uh, Democratic more than uh, married women. I think when women get married and they start having a different perspective about their husbands and their families, they start, and I don't, I don't really know why, but I think women tend to kind of um, lose some of the power in the, in the structure of the relationship, and they tend to vote the way their husbands either suggest or tell them how to vote. So they lose a lot of power, I think, when they're, when they're starting to vote and uh, making decisions. So we stress equality and uh, making sure that everybody in the community has access to the same information and uh, and yeah, that's pretty much what we focus on. So when it comes to feminism and women's issues, I actually uh, look at look at it as a whole. I look at it as issues for everyone. Oh, since the mayor has arrived, um, would you mind giving us a brief introduction of yourself? Um, your background, whatever you want to say, history experience wise. Um, I just did it with all the panelists, but you know. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Good to see you. Good evening, everybody. Good group. Um, I'm Carolyn Kamita. I'm mayor of the borough of Westchester. I'm in the fourth year of my first term, four year terms, two term limit, like president. Um, Prior to being mayor, I was uh, a borough council member in Westchester and represented one of the wards that included um, about half of the students living on campus. Uh, I am an alumna of Westchester, class of 74, education. Um, in addition to being mayor, I'm vice president and CFO of um, and a, a town planning business in the borough of Westchester, municipal planning. And I'm also on the board of directors of a non-governmental organization in affiliation with the United Nations focused on health and environment issues. And prior to um, being involved with those things, uh, I was um, uh, teaching a program for academically talented students in the public schools in the Octorera School. to do if you're going to be an elected official in, in, in the borough. <laughs> so, is that good? Yeah. Do you want me to re-ask the question? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, we just were discussing the question, uh, what does it mean to be a feminist, uh, to you at least, and uh, what role can men play or do they play? Okay. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I um, tend to think of, um, as Lisa already mentioned, feminisms, um, uh, a, very, a more kind of plural approach. And I think it's really some core values in if you're going to talk about it as a, a set of ideologies, if you will, gender ideologies. 
Um, and some of those revolve, revolve around how do we get to equality, and who has it and who doesn't have it. I take a political, you know, who's got a piece of the pie and who doesn't kind of approach. Um, and power, as has also already been mentioned. Um, and so sometimes I think that um, in terms of the negative connotations that feminism sometimes has for people now, especially younger folks, that um, that's really too bad because it um, takes away from these ideals that we have still a lot of um, concerns about, that not uh, a lot of people don't have equal access, there is discrimination, there is a wage gap, there is um, a gender gap in voting, there are people who will become biased um, for different social contexts, just as you just named, uh, be it by a father or a husband or a partner. Um, uh, time, you know, the day of the week you work sometimes biases you, right? Why the heck do we still have elections on Tuesday in the United States, for God's sake, right? So, you know, questions like that that are basic democratic questions that can blow up into bigger questions of who has power and who doesn't. Um, within uh, the article that I wrote about Bachelet, I described a, um, a um, continuum. Uh, my students who were in this class are going to laugh because I say I talk about these all the time, but um, continuums of an ideological set of ways of thinking about feminism um, and the, where um, those who embrace feminist ideals, and I just think men are in and out all the time. Um, there's a couple expressions that I use, uh, that are commonly used in Latin America in Spanish. One is they help us think about these things in terms of, not, it's not a dichotomy. It's not like men over here and women over here. Um, one is, cuerpo uh, de mujer no garantiza conciencia de género, and that means uh, a female body does not guarantee a gender consciousness. And I would reciprocate, put on the other end of that, cuerpo de hombre no garantiza que es un macho, right? So um, having a male body doesn't mean that you're a macho, right? Or that you're a power monger. Um, and so in those ways, I think that um, within feminisms, you have um, people who are working to promote policies of equality, such as access um, to the vote, citizens' rights, um, property ownership, um, a lot more. Um, there are folks who are working for reproductive rights, which is um, more in a different, you know, where sexes are different, and so we have to appreciate some of what that means and who has the right to decide um, what a woman does with her body, okay, or who allows for contraceptives or abortion. Um, and then you have folks working, um, again, farther towards kind of a social democrat or socialist sense of equality, of equality in the workplace, you know, who is allowed to work in a workplace. Um, well, how long did it take for women to be allowed to become minors? It's an Appalachian example. I taught a couple of years in Kentucky, and that was a really interesting set of questions for Appalachians. Um, and then um, when is it appropriate to foster separate spaces. And there's a lot of feminists, sometimes they're called radical, for um, considering that a separate space is appropriate for study or for um, victims of um, sexual violence, for example, um, to talk with a female lawyer as opposed to a male lawyer, and she had a male perpetrator, so that's not gonna help her develop trust without telling her story, right? Like, so there's been a lot of work done, for example, around that in Latin America, on, uh, victims of sexual violence going to an all-female um, police station, for example, right? So um, imagine that. We don't have that here. Um, and, I, and there's biases with that, and some of the female police officers don't like that because they feel like they're on a certain track and whatever. But for that, for the hundreds, thousands of victims that exist, that's enormous, okay? And so that's a, and that's a feminist achievement, I would say. So just in terms of giving some concrete examples and diversity of thinking about feminisms, I think that they're not, they don't break down along male-female lines often, it's about just what my colleagues have been talking about, so some echoes here. Thank you. Well, um, as you were talking and I was listening, I was also writing some things to answer this question, and I sort of brainstorm some of the things I thought about when I think of uh, feminism, and then the second half of the question is what we meant, right? Okay. Um, and 
some of the things that I listed were um, equality of opportunity, not preference, but equality of opportunity, uh, progress for everyone, for women, for men, for children, for people of, of all ages and all walks of life, balance, Feminism is about balance. Uh, it's about self-actualization. And feminism is about being responsible to yourself and to uh, your community and your society to uh, be who you are, develop your gifts. contribute to improving your own life and the life of people around you. So that was what I thought. When I thought of feminism, I saw it more of bal a balancing of the scales of human capacity. And um, some of you may be familiar with Nicholas Kristof, who's a columnist for the New York Times, and his um, book called Half the Sky. And basically what he uh, writes about is women are half the sky, men are half the sky. And when you eliminate the potential, the capacity for half the people in your community, in your country, or in your world, what are you missing? You can double your capacity when everyone is included. Not everyone has the same capabilities, gifts, capacities, and so on. But when you are eliminating the possibility of some or half the sky, what are you missing that could really raise the uh, quality of life and the capacity for a whole community? And in terms of what men can do, I think, um, uh, number one is to be aware of this concept. It, it's, um, uh, in fact, um, let's see, Hillary Clinton. Um, I have notes that I keep on all these things, and so I had to go through my, my uh, smartphone and find them all and, and get them in, a, in another form here, because I couldn't read it in the phone. Um, Hillary, of course, has been working hard um, for her whole life, and certainly during the four years when she was Secretary of State, to raise the status of women in the world. And um, so, and this comes from a Gail Collins column in, in the New York Times. Um, and she writes, for a long time, Clinton said, when she talked about giving women opportunity, I could see some eyes glazing over. But now, she continues, people are beginning to see that empowering women leads to economic development. That you don't espouse women's rights because it's a virtuous thing to do, but because it leads to economic growth. And so um, I would say that, you know, even if men, some men, and some women, um, some people, uh, have difficulty sharing the power or sharing capacity. There are different reasons for that. But if you, you know, the argument for economic development and the betterment of your own life and that of your community by including in this conversation women, um, might be good for me to do that. So it's another way of thinking about it. And, um, and so I think there are many men who already get it. And there are also women who don't get it. So, but it is an interesting um, concept, I think, to look at it in, in terms of economics. Thank you. So um, in some of our opening remarks, we mentioned that 
there are men's and women's political issues. Uh, it was suggested that women tend to shy away from some areas such as business, finance, or military and security issues. Now, Mayor Committed, as a councilwoman, you chaired the Borough Public Safety Committee, the Planning, uh, Zoning, Business, and Industrial Development Committee, and you also served on the um, Finance Committee. Have um, such sentiments impacted your role in any of these positions? Well, let me say this. I've, not, I've you know, fools rush in where wise people fear to, to whatever it is. But anyway, I've never shied away from any particular issue. Um, I think that the reason that men and women sometimes shy away from certain issues is that they don't feel uh, they have a, a certain competence in that area, um, don't want to speak to it, or you know, don't feel comfortable in that realm. But what I have learned, um, probably as a teacher when I was very young, is that you will never know as much as the other people around you. And so you can learn from your students, you can learn from your fellow uh, elected officials, and you learn from your citizens. So also as a newly elected borough council member, wanting to educate myself about democratic governance, what I learned, uh, I took a, a leadership uh, course on democratic governance, and I learned that uh, in democratic governance, the elected official has the responsibility to convene the conversation, sorry, frame the issue, then convene the conversation, the public conversation. Then the elected official should rightly hold the citizens who are a part of this conversation hold the citizens accountable for coming up with a solution that works for the majority of the people. So if you are aware of what democratic governance is, then you don't have to shy away as an elected official from things that you don't know anything about, which is most things. <laughs> um, and you invite people to the table, maybe who you know, are experts on certain things, and you also invite people who just know what it's like to live in the community and who can um, and share their experiences that way. So, I just, you're welcome. Can I say something about the first question? I'd like to do a little bit of self-reflection and and answer that question. If everybody here would think about their power and their confidence level and uh, how they fit into the grand scheme of things, whether it's your classroom or your family, and think about um, the amount of confidence that you have to move forward to gain the, the power and the education that you, that you, that you desire. And think about if uh, you're holding yourself back because of lack of confidence or lack of encouragement, whatever uh, the combination of things are. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with the ability to step into a role uh, like, um, for example, uh, being uh, asked or encouraged to uh, join the finance committee when you have absolutely no idea what it is you have to have that confidence to be able to say yes I will try it it's okay if I fail it's okay if I don't succeed right away but I'm going to learn something from it and I think everything that we're talking about today for the most part whether it's feminism and just combining the power for everybody uh, has so much to do with who you see, your, you, the way you look at yourself, and what you think that you're able to do. And um, I don't know if anybody has any comments about the uh, confidence that you feel or, do, or even want to share 
the, uh, a lack of confidence or fear that you have that you're going, not going to be able to succeed or make a fool of yourself. And if that's holding you back, and I think that uh, it also has a lot to do with not just confidence in the individual, but women also, it's self-imposed sometimes that we're not encouraged or we're not supposed to uh, be interested in finance or we're not supposed to be interested in uh, technology. And I, I think that we do, we do this to ourselves a lot and I wanted to know if anybody here has any comment about that or feeling that they want to share about that confidence level. Well, I, I, I first just want to thank you all for being here. I think, you know, we all have busy lives and I appreciate all of everyone being here. So um, the first thing I want to say to that point, um, Mayor Kamita, I really appreciated how you brought out the idea of self-actualization and how we're often confronted with um, social constructions of our identity rather than the self-actualization of our own confidence, our own capabilities. And I think um, as a liberal studies major and any major sitting in this room, we're going forward um, hopefully graduating, hopefully learning, bettering ourselves, but at the end of the day, what will we do with the, degree, with the degrees that we are earning? And um, I just think oftentimes my confidence may or may not suffer from some of the media reports and how um, I will be going forward, but I think the idea that you may, it's, conf it's confidence giving, or a good kind of pat on the back, I guess you could say, to know that like, even though I may not be graduating with a degree in finance, knowing that I left this school with an amount of knowledge that I'm satisfied with, but also the ability to learn and acquire new knowledge, I think is a great first step. So that's my comment. Um, a little bit more generally, I'm the only woman on the board of the Political Science Club, and uh, I have taken to asking people around campus about their political opinions and things, and uh, I've noticed an incredible number of girls who will look you dead in the eye and say, I don't care, I don't know, I'm not interested, this is not important to me, I've never voted, so on and so forth. And I'm, I don't want to say shocked and appalled, but I'm shocked and appalled <laughs> that so many people, like, have such disinterest and I wonder if you guys think that that's something that the political world is kind of pushing women out and pushing women to be disinterested or if you think that's something that's more of a social phenomena. I personally think it's uh, something that we learn growing up in the home and in school. I think it's something that we get used to if you're not in the home uh, of a a politically active family and you've never gone to the polls with your parents or you've never been encouraged to sit around the dinner table and have a conversation about your opinion uh, whether it's political issues social issues I think a lot of it has to do with what we get used to uh, as we're growing up and um, I, I need to um, is, can I make a confession that I grew up in a family. I did not uh, go to college. I was not educated. My, I, I'm 66 years old, so in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, my parents told me, just get married, have children, and your husband will take care of you. And, uh, but I always voted. That, that's just it. Uh, so. <laughs> I never really was interested in having discussions about uh, and, and expressing my worldview, but I, I still know that the way I grew up and what was discussed or not discussed in the home had a lot to do with what I did with my life. So I did get married young, had kids young, uh, and it's the biggest, well, can I say it's a mistake? I don't know. I mean, I have two great kids, and uh, I did get divorced, and I did uh, change my life along the way after I was out and about realizing what was out there, that there was so much more. So to answer your question, I think that 
Uh, it's not the fault of the politicians or anybody who's out there now uh, telling you you shouldn't or should have an opinion about politics. I think it has a lot to do with self-realization again and the way you, I mean, when you're 3, 5, 10, 15 years old, that is uh, a, a, a big impact on what you're, you're going to carry with you for the rest of your life. So uh, if we're going to blame anybody, I blame the parents. <laughs> As a sociologist on the panel, <laughs> what do you think? Um, I think parents are one social institution. You know, when you think about sort of what are the structures in our society that affect us and that nurture us and shape us, parents, and maybe I'm feeling particularly. Um, raw right now because I am a mother of a four-year-old. <laughs> God knows what's going to happen to that child. <laughs> um, but I think parents are influential, absolutely. I agree with that, but I think they're one factor. Um, one of my favorite colleagues, Jen Bacon, always says we all drink the same Kool-Aid. You know, that's where I got that from. We drink the same Kool-Aid. And so we are socialized into two genders. We are socialized not just to act certain ways as men and women, but also to get power in certain ways. So to your question, young women starting at, I mean, it used to be the study showed age 12, now it's much earlier, get power, are reinforced, their, their agency is reinforced through their appearance. Through their appearance. And we see this all over the map. We see this in clothing stores, we see this in the media, we see this um, when we do studies of education, you know, we see this all over. So I know for me, you know, and I'm also thinking about the earlier question, um, I was going to college 20 years ago and was told by my guidance counselor that I shouldn't go into science and math. And I'm a sociologist, <laughs> uh, much to my mother's glee. Um, but there are so many stories like that, and as a result, we have programs that encourage science and math for young women um, today. I guess I say that because I might look a certain way, but these ideas are not so old, right? These ideas are not so old. And I think it's important to think about how we're socialized to not just into roles of men and women, but how we prefer masculinity over femininity. And politics has been defined, thankfully, not as much today, but historically has been defined as a masculine entity. And so women can act masculine, men can act feminine, but it's what we value and it's what we appreciate. And so in women's and gender studies, we tend to talk about this stuff um, as that, as gender, as issues of femininity, as issues of masculinity. And so those comments that you hear, I hear them too. I was that young woman when I was 14, and thought, oh, I don't know about politics, which makes me laugh today. But what happens is we have to sort of like recharge and think about how we socialize our children to get their power differently. So we need to socialize against these um, influences that are giving power to young women just from, just by focusing on appearance and whatnot. We need to socialize against, and that's what feminism does. Feminism isn't just about Equity, it's, 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 it, I loved the scales, balancing the scales, that's perfect, Mayor Kamina, that's perfect. Um, it's a, and it's, it's about doing that for all kinds of identities, not just gender, right? So, I have, when you talk to young college students, you specifically said the women are really not interested, they're, they're not, uh, they don't want to express an opinion. Are there men who feel the same way or that she I would say it's drastically less men. There are some men who still, you know, give me the, I don't care, I'm not interested, but most men, I think, just, I mean, I, I am biased here, but I think a lot of guys just like to hear their own opinion over and over, and they will absolutely offer up, oh, this is what I think about women's issues, and I'm like, mm, that's, that's great and all, but probably not a good thing to have said to the only 
girl who actually apparently is asking people about politics. Well, men are socialized to assert their opinions. Women are socialized to not do that, which is why it's so important to have the programs that we have today to train women towards leadership. You know, we see a lot of those kinds of programs on our campus, in our communities. Um, it's not that women naturally are quiet. There's nothing on the second X chromosome that suggests <laughs> quietness. It's simply, you know, again, how, how we kind of reward it. First, I'd like to make a comment since, you know, being president of this club, it's hard enough to get anybody to, like, come to a meeting and discuss their political opinion, even in meetings, anybody. It's hard, to, it seems like people are skittish when it comes to politics, but I would have to agree, like, when we go out and ask for opinions, it's a lot harder to get it out of younger women. And, you know, I mean, period, I'm just looking for anybody, you know, to show up at a meeting and discuss what they think, because I want to know the campus's overall view. But um, it is quite difficult. Um, I'd like to ask another question, and it kind of relates to the mayor and also um, what our students and said with the uh, Chilean president. Um, would you say it's harder for a woman to be slash become an elected official and maintain uh, power or maintain their place, winning re-elections and so on and so forth? Uh, and this is for everyone, but because of sex, be because they are. Quick answer is yes, <laughs> which I think we all know, right? Um, and then the, the, the poli sci answer is it depends. Right? So um, it's sex, just as Elise was talking about breaking down socialization into lots of factors, so parents are a key one, um, breaking down into political leadership, sex is one factor. Um, it's made it trickier for women to get in the door. So in terms of like being able to say concretely, I'm being discriminated against because of my gender, that is that is clear and there's been important legal uh, progress um, that's been necessary to make that change. Um, lots of countries around the globe in the last decade, not, we're not talking about 30, you know, 40, 50 years ago, we're talking about now, have passed um, quotas to um, force parties and systems that were created around a patriarchal formation of politics to allow women in, right? And to force parties to say, all right, so we need to have um, at least three women on the council of the poli sci book of the 10 that you are, which I know that's like not the right numbers, but it, like, if we were talking about percentages, 30% is not a bad start, right? And that's where a lot of quotas start. So France has um, passed one, and then 30 wasn't enough. They went to parity. Wow, France. We're not talking about developing countries, right? Although that's where a lot of it has happened. Um, the Scandinavian countries have used this for a long time. Rwanda has the highest percentage of women in a parliament anywhere in the world right now. Rwanda, right? Like, what? Really? Um, and some other African countries that have used this mechanism. Okay. So, um, and lots of Latin American countries, so there's a lot of discussion about that right now. There has been, and now what a lot of us are studying is any impact, right? Do, do women act differently um, once they're in? And that's where it breaks down to there's more to it than just gender, right? And so, uh, for example, President Bachelet, in my research, if she hadn't been a socialist, would definitely not have supported some of the policies she did around gender equity questions, right? Like with um, sexual harassment policies that were passed, they were kind of wimpy, but they got passed, right? Like, it's gotta start somewhere. Um, people pay for equal work, um, had not been entertained by even her former male socialist predecessor, she pushed it through, okay? Uh, cost her some political capital, okay? But that was something that she really thought this is gonna be equal opportunity for everybody because a female earner in whatever family is benefiting the family and the community just as Mayor Committee was spelling out in the beginning. So it's not only about that one woman earning more money, it's about what she's gonna do with that money, right? And, and that goes back into the whole economy and et cetera. So um, I would say, going back to where you were talking about, um, it's just one thing. And I agree, absolutely. And politics isn't for everybody, man or woman, okay? I mean, it, 
it's a choice. It's a preference or a non-preference. I'd also like to point out that there is a majority of women students here tonight. So just, to, just you know, for a shout out. And, <laughs> and a shout out to the men who are here. So, yeah. um, because it, it really is um, uh, everybody's story. Um, I think that uh, what gets people interested in politics is when the government, local, state, or national, is affecting your life personally. I think that's when people get involved. I think that's also sometimes when women get involved in politics, of course sometimes they also get recruited. <laughs> And speaking of the fear factor, your question, I just wanted a little disclaimer here. I have been terrified so many times. I mean, I sort of answered it in a very strong way, and that's how I behave, but that doesn't mean that I'm not often terrified, that I don't know what to do, I have to figure it out, I never did this before. We've all been terrified. If you're not terrified, you're not trying anything uh, different. And so, you know, if you're being terrified, you're heading in the right direction. Uh, and when I was asked to run for mayor, uh, not mayor, for a council, my first answer was, no, I can't do that. And then I was encouraged a little bit more, and honestly, I was terrified because I thought, I would have to be in public, I would have to talk to, no, I was a teacher, but you know, then I raised kids for 20 years. Anyway, I hadn't done it for a while, and I thought I can't do that anymore. The point is, everything leads to everything. You keep reinventing yourself in your life, whatever your, um, whatever your path. Um, and in terms of um, women getting involved, whether it's in um, elected uh, positions, um, or electing people, whether they're men or women, hopefully the most confident person will win, regardless of gender. Um, one of the things that we're seeing in this last election, for example, is that there was the largest gender gap in history, as shown by the Gallup poll with Obama winning the vote of single women by 36%. More women voted in the last election than men. So you talk about women, get, sorry, I'm pointing at you. I should, I should do as they do this. Um, That's but what um, more women voted than men. So maybe at the college level, people are, people are busy. People's lives are busy. They get distracted. They're worried about you know, boys and girls, men and women, you know, of all ages, you know? I mean, your love life, if you're hungry, <laughs> if you've got a test, it's all the same. Um, and, it, and somebody says, and what are your political, and you're like, I can't think about that right now. <laughs> so, you know, it's understandable. More women voted than men. Five women were newly elected to the Senate, and the number of women in the House has increased by four. New Hampshire will be the first state to send an all-female delegation to Congress. Now they only have two senators and I think one more. One more. But that's okay, it's 100% <laughs> of New Hampshire. Um, and, uh, then, and then also, you know, in, in terms of equal opportunity electing the best person for the job regardless of gender. Voters anointed a lesbian senator, three new gay congressmen, and three states voted to legalize same-sex marriage. So, but women were the majority of the voters in the last election. So, your colleagues may not be you know with the program and thinking about um, voting now. Um, quite honestly, although I always voted, Merle, League of Women Voters, I never didn't, I never missed a primary or a general ever. Um, but I couldn't have told you when I was raising my kids and doing all the PTO and all of 
that that's where my head was. I could tell you everybody, the teachers and the principals. I could not have told you who the borough council members were, nor could I have told you who my representative was. It did nothing had come up that affected my personal life. They were taking care of things just fine. So I really think it has to do with personal, you know, when they start messing with your trash collection and stuff, you get hundreds of people show up. And that's when you get, and then people go, oh, there are other things happening maybe I should pay attention to, but it's pretty normal. I, I want to get back to the original question of this round about women, uh, it was, uh, are more women elected? Oh, it, or it, it's what? harder for uh, women to get elected and okay. maintain their okay. position. I want to uh, ask another uh, question about uh, women in elected office or women in leadership roles. We were talking about uh, women who uh, maybe supported certain issues and that may not have been popular, so they weren't reelected. I want to, to hear your opinion about uh, if you think that women, for the most part, now in general, women have uh, come into elected office or choose to run for leadership roles, coming in with uh, several different distractions than a man does when it comes to running for office. Uh, when a woman decides whether she wants to run for office or not, she, more than men, and I don't know if this is true, I'm not a sociologist, but tell me if it's true, the women think more about their families and how it will impact the family, how it will impact uh, uh, maybe wh whatever is going on in her family and her children, will a woman you, uh, think more about these distractions than a man does? When a man runs for office, is it easier for him to just look at three or four different things in his life and say yes or no? Or when a woman runs for office or whether she decides to uh, choose a leadership role, will will she have many more distractions that will prevent her from making um, a good decision or a bad